Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, available at opednews.com slash podcasts, at Pacifica Radio Network, at iTunes, at Stitcher, at Progressive Radio Network. And my guest for this show, I'm very excited to have, uh, Kelvin Campbell is the author of Massive Small Change. I think it's the biggest book I've gotten in years. And it's an amazing book that I'm very excited to talk to Kelvin about. This is I, I can't tell you how excited I am. Kelvin Campbell is a collaborative urbanist and writer. He's the chair of Smart Urbanism and the Massive Small Collective. He's a former visiting professor in urban design at the University of Westminster and chairman of the Urban Design Group. Campbell is now honorary professor at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College of London. Best website to check out is MassiveSmall.com. So great to have you on the show and great to meet you. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks for having me on. So let's start off. What is Massive Small? I think Massive Small comes out of a frustration of 25 years of consultancy in urban planning and design, where I kind of recognized that the top-down models were not working anymore. I mean, the concept of the master plan was dead. And it was dead for a number of reasons, because uh, firstly, there wasn't a commitment from the top to implement the bottom, you know, I implement the project. Uh, and the second was the recognition that despite the fact that we had incredible range of tools in the past couple of years to deliver much more successful places, we weren't delivering the quality of life that we expect about towns and cities. And I'm talking about towns and cities that um, we probably value from maybe three or four generations ago, which uh, has served us incredibly well. We just haven't built a decent urban neighborhood anywhere in the world uh, in the past three generations, and something must be wrong. So you talk, you're talking about top-down and bottom-up. What are your definitions of top-down and bottom-up? Now, you know, I, I just need to say, I've been doing a show on, my show is called The Bottom-Up Show, and I've been doing it for 11 years, and I have my own ideas about bottom-up and top-down. So um, I love when I've got somebody who's talking about it as much as you. Uh, well, from my perspective, Top-down is generally governance or government, uh, in, in my world, imposing a top-down view on how people should live their lives. And bottom-up is actually a reaction by citizens to do it in a different way. So I see this, this conflict all the time between government and people. And in many ways, that's the, that's the thing that hasn't been reconciled. And it certainly hasn't been reconciled in a world where government is increasingly not delivering on their promises. So all those promises they made us say po in post-war years, which was, um, we'll solve your housing crisis, we'll sh solve your health crisis, we'll sh solve your, your education crisis. Um, effectively, they're not delivering anymore. And I think people increasingly are taking back responsibility for, for many of those things. And you're seeing this not in a, not in a third world or a, a global south um, situation, you're seeing this globally. You're seeing increasingly people getting on with things despite government rather than because of government. Well, let me just throw you some of my thinking at you, okay? Uh, I, I got into bottom-up because I saw that the more bottom-up an approach I took to running my website, the more successful it was, meaning the more I involved other people, the users and participants in it, in, 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 in deciding how things were done. So I found some uh, pretty exciting success with bottom-up, and that got me wanting to learn, out, learn more about it. And it took me places I never imagined. And one of the things is that I, I learned about the, the, the work of uh, Darsha Narvaez, the, uh, the neurobiology of the development of human morality, in which she described how humans before civilization evolved in hunter-gatherer bands, smaller than tribes, where they lived very bottom-up lives, interdependent, cooperative, and very conscious of each other's needs and how their behaviors affect them. To me, this is the ultimate bottom up. And, and what I think is so exciting about it is we evolved to be that way with literally hundreds of genes that affect the way be, we behave in a bottom up way. And then civilization came along, which was top down. And I think it repressed a lot of that. And I think now we're in the middle of a bottom up re-evolution or ev a revolution uh, I, I'm, I'm conscious of you saying evolution, not revolution in your book, that is really bringing us back to a potential that we've had, that we have within us, that, that this is a power, a kind of intelligence that is there waiting for us to awaken from its dormancy. I think that's absolutely right. 
you know, for me, bottom up is innate. There's no central controller. You don't need to teach it. And my closest example in my world is, say, an informal settlement. Let's, let's look at, say, a favela on the outskirts of Rio. So there isn't a single planning system in place. There isn't a single central controller telling people what to do. They don't, there's no design code. There's no plan. Yet people get on with this. They, they, they develop simple rules. Uh, they effectively adapt. Uh, they start by starting and learn by doing. They adapt quite quickly. And the tactics they use tend to be around self-organization. And that's, that's a process that doesn't require any invisible control or hidden hand to make sure it happens. Um, the interesting thing about bottom-up is that bottom-up within a short space of time creates its own top-down systems. You know, as people evolve through the process, and I, I, I use evolution and revolution together, and I see revolution just as an extension of, of evolution. Evolution is a progressive process, and quite often it requires evolution to speed it up, a revolution to speed it up. So these things are not, um, they're not fundamentally opposed to one another. They're just parts of a process. And I think what, you, what you're referring to is, is increasing what I see is much more of a revolution in thinking about how we do these things. So I think you're probably right in using it. I'm trying to say that what, what happened probably about three generations ago was we interrupted the evolutionary process. So where people innately did things, understood how to do things, understood how to build communities, build fantastic neighborhoods that we all value, that we kind of go on holiday to, that process was stopped. And you're absolutely right. It sits dormant within people because you can activate it. You can activate it quite quickly. And I'll, I write a lot about it in the book about uh, the activators. How do you effectively get back to the concept of the active citizen getting on and doing things? Particularly in a world where a majority of people would say, well, it's not our role anymore. Governments have taken this role from us. You know, why should we look after the poor? You know, government are going to do that. We pay our taxes so people can look after the poor. Or, you know, why should we, um, you know, why should we create our own healthcare system when uh, the government's supposed to do that for us? Well, increasingly, you're seeing people saying, well, it's not delivering on the qualities we want. And they're effectively saying, let's go back to rediscover that. And what you're seeing is, is definitely a revolution in people's thinking about how they, how they want to tackle these complex issues. And I think they also want to move away from... Um, this incredible thing called the urban environment, which is this complex adaptive system that we've treated as a mechanical model for three generations. We've actually used blunt instruments like, like statistics, like predicting and planning, like um, command and control, all these sort of very blunt instruments to effectively um, control the thing that's absolutely critical to our own lives. In fact, a city is like a, city is like a human body. It's, it has exactly the same, it's an organism. Um, you almost can't control an organism in the same way as you might control, say, a machine. Yet, for the past three generations, the metaphor of the machine is used consistently in the design of cities. I, 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 would, really I would say it goes back a couple hundred years. Uh, uh, I, I, I think that we have our, 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 our Western culture evolved with the Newtonian Cartesian model of science that was a linear, mechanistic, atomistic one. And That's modern right. science found that that approach worked for some stuff, but it didn't work for particle physics or some atomic physics, and it didn't work for ecosystems. And the, the model that needs to be used is a systems theory, chaos theory model that looks at patterns and relationships. Absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I certainly embrace the whole concept of the chaotic um, principle, which is this interface between chaos and order which is the sweet spot of generative emergence. That's actually, if you can maintain yourself in that world between chaos and order, that's where you really create, um, you really produce creativity. The problem is that we've deviated to, or we've, 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 we've extended ourselves far into the order regime where it's, um, it's rigid order. And that rigid order is killing creativity, killing innovation, creating emerg uh, killing emergence. And I think that's the challenge that we face is how do you get back into that kind of world of, of of the chaos, that, that point that um, D. Hock refers to all the time. Now, you refer to, and you break your book into three parts, the system and the, the, the change and, and the way, uh, or the way and the change. And you, 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 you say the system is not broken, it was built this way. Talk a little bit about the system, because I think that's a really important part of getting, pulling this together. Well, I think, um, uh, you, uh, coming back to the first point, I think we've been on this reductionist path for a long time. You're absolutely right. We, we schooled in reductionist thinking. And um, 
it's a linear way. It's a sort of, um, it's a very tree-like way of thinking where you lead from point one to point one, point one, point one, point one, point A, you know, the classic sort of way in which you might structure a report. And that's, that's the way we've been schooled in the way, in, in the way to think, in a, in a, in a highly reductionist um, analysis, hypothesis, and, uh, and synthesis kind of approach that we've taken for years. Now, in, in a funny way, what's, what happened post-war, I think, and, and I'll go back and tap into it in, um, in when, this, when this all went wrong for cities. And it wasn't done with bad intentions. It was effectively the whole world saying, look, we have to rebuild our societies, our urban societies. And um, what we're going to do is we as government are going to take on this responsibility to do it, whether it was the returning GIs or whether it was um, rebuilding Germany or rebuilding the um, uh, uh, United Kingdom uh, at the time. And the two big visions that were out there were the modern city vision and the garden city vision. And both of them are highly reductionist um, ways of thinking about cities. Both of them effectively are anti-city movements but they were very seductive to, to politicians because they presented a, a, a strong sort of social engineering approach to the design of cities, or they presented a very strong mechanistic approach. And it tapped into the kind of tools and the thinking that were available politically at the time. And in fact, that's what we still in, you know, buried deep, deep into the DNA of most planning systems in most parts of the world. And I can honestly say that I'd probably say the figure is probably closer to 90% of many planning systems are these two big movements, the modern city movement and the garden city movement. The one that spawned, the garden city movement effectively spawned the concept of suburbia, and the modern city, modern city movement was effectively the downtown, if you want to call it that, the, the, the central business district kind of um, view of the world. So we have these two, these two grand visions that government said, well, that'll work for us. That gives us a very strong political, brave new world kind of vision to sell to people in rebuilding Europe or rebuilding um, the states or many other, many other colonies that exist or many other countries that were involved in this time. And those that didn't effectively borrowed the system as well. So it became such a powerful movement that it spawned itself in most parts of the world. It became the, pre the prevalent way of doing it. And you almost can't put a, a slip of paper between many planning systems. There might be slight differences on the tools and the mechanisms they use, but the un underlying philosophies of the modern planning system really come back from those two strong roots. And that's effectively where we went wrong. And, but as I said, it was done with good intentions. It was done with good intentions that we're going to give people a better life. We're going to provide this sort of social utopian view of the world. And effectively, at that point, we moved away from a distributed system, which is how cities were built. You know, they, as I said, if you go back to, you know, pre, say, 1945, 46, 47, uh, most stuff would have been distributed. Uh, most people would have known how to build cities and make places. Uh, what stepped in post then was this utopian view of what it should be. And well, I think what's, people, a, what's a distributed system? What does that mean? So a distributed system means that um, everyone knows how to do it. It's evolved over time as being the normative way of doing things. So the classic would be in, say, a build, you know, say builders building in Victorian times. Um, it would have been entirely distributed in the sense that there would have been thousands of small builders building thousands of thousands of houses. In fact, in Victorian times, they built more houses uh, four times more houses, in fact, than we built at the height of our last housing boom. So a distributed system of thousands of small, small um, builders working together, collaborating within a fairly simple set of rules, built some of the things that we probably value the most. most. I'm talking about, if you look at, say, the normative stuff that might have happened in New York or might have happened in Boston or in many other cities, we're really of that era that we kind of value today. We value so much that we, create, we call them historical areas. But they were done with, without a single view. There was a movement, obviously, about, how, you know, what, about design and about classicism and neoclassicism, about order and harmony. But in, in, in a funny way, there wasn't a single vision that said, this is the way it should be. And I think what happened, as I said, post-war was this, this adoption worldwide of this very strong top-down order of social utopia. And that social utopia was dependent on gov government delivering it delivering a new town. You know, I often say, if you look at, say, um, uh, uh, what I probably referred to a bit earlier was bottom-up systems in a short space of time create top-down systems. So you can't have bottom-up, you can't have bottom-up with some form, without some form of top-down because it naturally evolves into top-down system. It's a natural, that's how societies evolve. They evolve from bottom-up systems, rules get formed, hierarchies get established, uh, and through this process, structures get formed, and then people start uh, adopting these structures as, as ways of governing themselves. 
And that's pretty much a universal kind of approach that's happened. So bottom up needs top down. Top down doesn't need bottom up. Okay, Stalin did it quite well. Stalin could effectively say, I will build entire cities, you will behave exactly as I tell you to do, you will, you know, you will conform um, you know, to, to the nth degree in, in terms of what we as government say you should do. So you can, you can effectively have top down with the, without bottom up, but bottom up requires an element to top down. So I constantly talk about how, does, how do top down systems facilitate much more bottom up behaviors? And why do top down systems kill bottom up behaviors? You know, we, the, the, the energy that comes in many small bottom up um, projects, whether it's reclaiming a street or whether it's um, creating an informal settlement or um, uh, you know, a, a temporary use that might happen in a building of some sort, within a short space of time, the top down systems will prevent it happening. They will close it down. And quite often, bottom up requires the energy of a few small people who stick to it long enough uh, to, to persevere. But I keep on saying, but why, do government do that? why does government do that? Why doesn't government facilitate more bottom-up behaviors? You know, if you look at many of these things, they're solving urban problems. They're helping government solve some very complex urban pro problems that they can't solve themselves. So when I write about this in the book, I always write about it. My, the perspective I have at, at the back of my mind is, so what do I tell government? So, and most of the time, I'm advising governments and mayors and, 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 um, and people within command and control position, how they need to change their behaviors to facilitate more bottom-up action. Because so, bottom-up bottom up is innate. Bottom-up will happen. You know, you just have to release it. It's, it's like a, it's an energy that just needs releasing. How do you get people to release it? I think, by example, um, I think increasingly, once people feel liberated and they can do it, uh, they, they do it more and more. Generally, it requires a couple of outcasts or a couple of, um, I just call them innovators or disruptors at this point in time, to start this process. But once it happens, once people realize they can start doing it, uh, they effectively, it accelerates quite quickly. Yeah, the other uh, side of it, though, is that there are some people who are afraid of it. Uh, I, of I, I interviewed the uh, creator of Holacracy, this non-hierarchical management model that is being used in about 500 companies now. And what they found is they offer employees when they change a company from a top-down hierarchical management system to a, a, a non-hierarchical model that about 25% of the employees don't want to be there. They don't want to be given the power. They don't want to own the responsibility. They want to stay within hierarchy. And I think that's because there are a certain number of people who, and, I, and, I, and I, this word has popped up a lot in what you've been saying in my head, is authoritarianism. I think that a lot of people need that and they've been programmed with that. And part of the challenge of bringing more bottom up is dealing with people's needs for an authoritarian system. What do you think? I think, I, think that's, I think a lot of people have comfort in knowing how they have to behave, uh, how they have to conform. I think there's also another thing which is, which is fascinating is um, Philip um, Ball talks about it in his book, Critical Mass, which is he talks about the science of society uh, and the way it's also referred to as the nature of conformity as most people want to conform. Most people want to belong to something. They want to belong to normative ways of doing things. And they find it very difficult to step outside comfort zones. Um, Everett Rogers has got even a better description of it in, his, um, in that bell curve he, he has of innovation of, you know, the first 3% of the, the innovators, uh, the next one are the early adopters, uh, and the next ones are, you know, so you almost have to create 16% before you get the, um, the, the next range of adopters, and then it follows with the late adopters. The late adopters follow when everyone else, do it, when it, when it, when it, when everyone else does it, they follow. So I think there's a natural process that exists across society, um, and it's, it's mapped quite clearly in, in, in marketing terms about what is the tipping point at which it becomes adopted by everyone. And I think, there's a, I think Everett Rogers puts it down to some quite clear numbers. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it, to me, I think that's, that's the nature of the human being. The nature of the human being is that you're gonna get some left-minded people and some right-minded people. Some right-minded people uh, wanna think, completely creatively outside the box and the left-minded one wants much more structure and order and i think that's that's just a normal composition of society the interesting thing for me 
is at what point does change happen? What point does that, tip, that tipping point happen? And, um, you know, if you try this, and I've seen this quite often, in, there's, there's always, whenever I give a lecture, there would always be 25% of contrarians who say, but, you know, you're just a libertarian or you're just a, you know, uh, you're just trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But in many ways, it's not about that at all. It's about how, how does change happen? And change happens through a set of very complex activities, which, um, which we can quantify. We can actually model and we can effectively show how this tipping point happens. And, okay, um, well, wait, let's take a little break. I need to do a show ID and then we'll talk about how change happens, okay? Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, for the video, I've already identified this is the, the Rob Call Bottom Up show. For the radio, I need to do a 10 second pause so I can throw in a bumper, okay? So just quiet for 10 seconds. My guest for this show is Kelvin Campbell. He's the author of Massive Small Change, and he's honorary professor at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at the Bartlett School of Ag Architecture, University College, London. So you're going to talk about how change happens. Yeah, I mean, changes, um, system change is, is, is as complex as, um, as, as no change, um, in the sense that the uh, majority of people maintain the status quo. It's, it's, a, it's a natural process. The interesting thing is about how you, how you bring about change. The first, the first thing for me is that revolutionary change is quite difficult for majority of people to, to, to accept. And therefore, the process of many small changes adding up to something that, if you can scale these up quite quickly, give you uh, the concept of revolution anyway, but they just give it to you in a smaller progressive way. I call it radical incrementalism. It's my sort of other definition of massive small. This idea that you can be radical and incremental. And those two sound like they're fundamentally opposed. Radical means quick change. Incremental means slow change. So how do you create quick, slow change? And that's effectively what the massive small story is about. And people feel more comfortable if you can show the change happening by not cataclysmic change, by saying, in order for us to, if I walked into a mayor and said, uh, in order for you to change what you're doing, you have to scrap every single policy you've got and start again. He wouldn't do it. He just wouldn't do it. But for me, I'd say, well, let's start by starting. Let's start around this. Let's learn. Let's get rapid and continuous feedback from this process. And let's feed it back into the system. And let's do it again. And let's do it again. Let's do it again. And I love the concept here, which is managing in the presence. Marcus Aurelius talks about it quite, quite well, is that effectively you, you're almost acting like a sound engineer at a concert where you're not flicking switches on and off, but you're making small shifts on that, on that, um, on that sound desk as the orchestra's playing. And that's what I think increasingly the role of the planner should be, uh, the urban planner should be, is much more like a sound engineer type approach, making small shifts. And ultimately, this, this cacophony of sound turns into something quite beautiful because someone's managing that process and managing the, the ability for it to, to do something different. How, so do we, how do we start though? When you, start, when you go to that mayor and you get him to say, okay, yeah, I wanna make massive small change happen. What are the starting steps? Quite often, they're very, very small. They're very, very small steps. They let's let's try something. Let's start something on that corner. Let's not take a big site. In fact, I'm one of my one of my big one of my I'm a fan of a big project in, in, in Berlin called the Berlin Townhouse Project, which is effectively the the mayor saying, "I get scared of big sites. You know, let's start on small things because they're more manageable. Let's learn from that. Let's people see that they feel comfortable in. Oh, I, I can buy into that. That works." You can then test it. You can see the viability of it. You can see uh, that it might deliver on better outcomes or better values, whatever it is uh, to people. So you start on something which effectively is very tangible, very visible. It doesn't have to be a physical project as well. A lot of the projects I'm working on at the moment are, are, are much more software type projects in the sense they're much more about health projects or um, uh, skills and training type projects. Because once you have that, you start building confidence in the process, the ability to change. So for a lot of people, change is... Change is threatening if it's seen as too big. I'll, I'll give you one example. Was I was working on a project called the, um, uh, the Southall Charter, which is a, an area in, in West London, which um, has um, over 10,000 beds and sheds. Basically, it has backyard informal settlements in West London. And I went walk about with um, Boris Johnson, who was the mayor, and... Um, he said, what do you think we should do about it? And I said, well, let's just le let's work with it, legalize it and stuff. And he said, that's too big for me to deal with. It's too big. It's, legalize is too big. 
you know, in other words, let's turn a blind eye. So for politicians who have a short horizon, sometimes these things are too big to deal with and therefore they steer away from it. What should have happened really was to say, let's test this in a, in a few places. Let's test this in a, in a selected few. Let's see if it works better for us. Let's work with the community. Let's come and say, well, let's do a trade-off. You do this, you know, the co we introduce this concept of we will if you will sort of transaction. So what will you do? What will we do? And how do we then solve this complex problem, which is basically a national housing crisis that we have in the UK? So, um, it, you know, for me, that's the sort of message I give all the time. Let's identify the low-hanging fruit. Go for that low-hanging fruit. Go for a raft of them. Don't put your eggs all in one basket. Go for, say, say about 10 of them. And each of them have a slightly different impact. But what they start doing is they start building confidence in, in people, that they have the ability to, to make a change. And then you, you scale it up, you scale it up, you scale it up to the point that all of a sudden there's 50 projects happening or 100 projects happening. And then you look at it collectively and you say, wow, we did that? I mean, one of my, one of my, um, I'm a big fan of, of Jason Roberts and um, uh, the Better Block Project where he went out one weekend in Dallas and effectively reclaimed a street. And, you know, he did it because he saw this fairly lousy street that um, was bound up in bylaws and, and, um, and rules, you know, silly rules that are part of a whole legacy. And he effectively went and colonized the street and, and then invited the council along and said, so what's wrong with this? And by that time, everyone had bought into that the street could be a fantastic, great street. So this idea that you can show by example, and once you do that, you, you create a tipping point quite quickly. So for me, it's, it's looking at that broad raft of, of possibilities where you can make some sort of inroads and then to say, look, guys, what have we got to lose here? Um, and quite often what I show is, is two approaches. This bottom-up world creates the following. This top-down world has created this, this outcome. Which outcome would we rather have? Why are we frightened? Why are we frightened of this approach? You know, planners are frightened that people will go crazy and do things. But if you look at the nature of conformity, most people behave in similar ways. Most people want to conform. Most people want to belong in particular ways. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in live in the same ways as, as, as other people. We, we feel threatened by this all the time. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've got my book coming out next month, The Bottom-Up Revolution. And in it, I talk about the problems with big and, and that big is a pro is, can be pathological. Uh, and, and you talk about giantism and... Uh, I, I, I don't know where you put it, but you, you mentioned giantism, and, and I believe that too big can be, uh, is, is something that we need to look at, diagnose, and, and, and try to replace as much as we can with small. And, and I wonder, have you looked at the idea of a model of small as in terms of creating businesses and looking at businesses, I know your main focus is on ur urban planning and, and that kind of work. A lot of what we do tips across. In fact, a lot of the work I'm doing, a lot of the startup projects are effectively business startup projects. Oh, great. You can, up, you can scale up from the lowest level. One example is um, a small recycling, a bicycle company that builds small wagons uh, that they tether at the back of bicycles and they effectively go around and collect um, litter and recycle. There's two businesses in there. One is the, the guy who makes the, um, makes the trailer that fits on the back of the bike, which coincidentally is an electric powered trailer, um, which fits onto a normal bicycle. And the other is the business of collecting and recycling. So those two things work hand in hand and they're small beginnings. You know, they don't require much levels of investment, but they're highly visible signs of change in a community. People see this, oh, that's interesting. You know, wh wh how did that happen? And all of a sudden, you know, a couple of days later, you'll see 10 bicycles. And for me, those are the sorts of things that, that are very high impact. And, it, and they also the early, they, you can start early. The building process quite often is, 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 a slow, is a slower project. It takes a bit more time, a bit more lead time. But a lot of the social change projects are about building confidence in a community. And uh, you can start many of these quite quickly. I'm, I'm interested in, in why we became, why bigness became part of the system. And I mentioned a bit earlier about distributed systems. And when governments came in, effectively it was driven by big government. It was a big government vision of the world. You know, it was effectively, we will take responsibility for your housing, for your health, for your education. We look after the poor, don't worry, pay your taxes, we'll look after the poor for you. And what happened about two or three decades after that was effectively government saying, oh, hold on, we don't want to do this. And they started mirroring big, um, big private, big private sector effectively became the shadow that it sat, sat behind 
um, sat behind big government. You know, you, you have talk classic- about the shift from from big that your vision is to go from big to small government. That's right. Yes. Well, I think I think in many in many ways, there are still things that require um, project projects to be thought of at scale. So bigness is not bigness can't be confused with scale. That's the first thing that people do. So if you're conceiving of say a railway line, or you're conceiving, conceiving of a new harbour, or a, a new a design of a new city, it requires the thinking at scale. The question is, how do you deliver it? How do you deliver that? Um, there's a big debate that's happening in the, um, in, in the UK at the moment around a high-speed rail link that's going in, which will deliver very few benefits. But if that amount of money was translated into thousands of small projects around stations, which would make stations a bit more accessible, which would make, say, much more you know, small business, um, uh, business centers where you could have high-speed internet, you could have meetings and that stuff, all of a sudden it would change the nature of how we travel. So it's almost quite often looking at things through the other side of the lens. You know, quite often we look at it from the, the point of view, we need to solve a big problem and therefore we need a big solution. And quite often the problems that can be solved could be through thousands of small projects which would add up to a far, far better place, a far better outcome than we imagined in the first place. So, I, but I'd like you to get into a little bit more detail the difference between bigness and scale. As I said, I mean, projects, Many projects need to be conceived of as scale, at scale. A scale implies that if you say building a new um, a railway network through a town, you have to plan at the macro. You have to plan at the, macros, the macro size. The question is, who builds it? Does one single contractor build it? Is this parceled up into thousands of small contractors that, that build it or build parts of it or supply it? Okay. The instinct at the moment for government is it's too difficult for them to herd cats to actually to deal with many small um, organizations and it's easier for them <laughs> well you're you're, you're, pa- you're freeze that okay recording's going now go many projects in cities have to be conceived of at scale um, a good example the classic is let's put a new railway network into a town or a city um, that requires big macro thinking it doesn't imply that there's a single solution to building it. It could be built with many thousands of interventions, many thousands of suppliers. Um, it doesn't imply that you have to automatically go to the big guy to deliver the project for us. But we have this temptation at the moment, big temptation, because it doesn't want to deal with many small things. So we had another problem with the with the, the the screen freezing. So, what's fascinating to me is what you're saying is that really big projects need scale, but they don't have to be really big in terms of one big organization producing them. A, a big project can have thousands of many small parts, and there's a, a tendency to resist doing that, as you said, hurting cats. And, and, and this is where I think that we need a science of small business, where we need to develop specific models and strategies for, so that leaders are, feel safe to coordinate with thousands of small businesses and small parts to making big projects happen. Yeah, if you, if you just took risk, let's just take risk. Um, if if you have 200 small players doing a project and 10 fail, okay, um, versus one big player and they fail, who wins? Now, we just, we just experienced this in the UK where Carillion, one of the biggest government outsourcing agencies, failed. Where they were running all our hospitals, running all our major public sector projects. In fact, they were running this major rail project. They failed. They required massive bailing out by government uh, to solve some of the problems, and, and many of the small guys got hurt as a result of that. So the real question at the end of the day is, what's the best way in terms of building an economy of a country? What's the best way of creating this idea that, that something small can scale itself up to something a bit bigger over time? And we don't allow that to happen. So increasingly, um, the example I mentioned in Berlin, which is where the mayor had said, I don't want to procure, I don't want to parcel all my big sites up and effectively 
run a beauty parade to the 10 big developers to develop this because they hold me to ransom. They fail. They hold me to ransom or they come back and ask for more money and effectively I'm, they don't deliver on, the, on their promises. They overpromise and underdeliver. It's pretty much a norm that happens in most big projects. So he effectively changed the game plan to say, well, I'd rather procure small six meter wide plots, okay, and effectively put that out to tender. And he put thousands of these out and delivered incredible quality to the point that they were delivering much better housing with much better social outcomes at a fraction of the price and much quicker. So in other words, the concept of managing many small wasn't as difficult as he made them out to be. He just required a set of simple rules to do it. He didn't deal directly for the individuals. He dealt with building groups. He said, you guys as a group of people go away and organize or self-organize. You agree your budget. You agree what you're doing. Come and talk to me and I'll help you deliver your project. So they're delivering these projects at scale without a big, there's no single big developer driving it. And so, you've you know, said that said that in your book, you say that Berlin is probably the best place when it comes to massive small too. Well, I, I, find, I find some really good, you see, firstly, citizen action is very strong in Berlin and it's, it's, it's been a strong thing. You know, people, constructive activism is seen as, as your duty as a citizen in Berlin. You react to the projects that come to you. So there's effectively an armed group of people who react to things that they don't think that are good for Berlin. The second thing is you're seeing enlightened leadership and this enlightened leadership is not a left-wing leadership, it's, um, it's a mild right. So this is not a, um, you know, everyone's, everyone in Europe is operating in the social market democracy anyway. Uh, there's not much change between them in terms of the politics. Um, it's just that some guy saw a different way of, of, of looking at it. He looked at it by saying, well, hold on, what we're doing at the moment is not working for society. We need to find a different way. So he tried something different and it worked. Now, that's what we need more and more. We need enlightened civic leaders who not... You know, quite often when you talk about the concept of a leader, everyone says we need a strong leader to drive this through. Actually, what you want is you want an enabling leader. You want an enabling leader who says, let's just release, let's release this potential of people to solve. Let's release this latent energy that exists in people to solve problems. And we will be surprised. We, let's embrace unpredictability, which is a very, very difficult thing for politicians to do. You know, it's very difficult when I say it, you know, at the moment, embrace unpredictability. What do you mean, unpredictability? I said, well, that's the outcome. Something might happen, which was far, far better than we ever expected. So what's wrong with that? That's actually what happens. Because as an urban planner, I can't predict every outcome. All I can do is create the conditions within which people can respond. And if that respond is, this response is fantastic, something comes out the woodwork that we never predicted and is far, far better than we ever predicted, wouldn't that be great? Let's harness that. Let's harness that potential. And I think that's how we have to start seeing cities as much more managing the creative energy of, of, of people who have this ability to solve problems. Not all of them have it, but people will follow. The 25% follow inevitably. I wouldn't worry. Someone said to me a long time ago, don't worry about the contrarians. The contrarians will always follow. You'll always get people saying no. Don't even try and convince them. They will follow sooner or later. So convince the people who on your side. What, what interests me is you said that it was a conservative leadership. And, I, and when I think about big government versus small government, I think that liberals and, and, and lefties tend to prefer big government and conservatives Absolutely. tend to, to prefer small government. But when we're talking about top down and bottom up, small government is bottom up. And so I'm challenged to figure that out because I'm a lefty and uh, uh, I, I, I believe that big is a problem. We need to stop big as much as possible, including government. So how do we reconcile that? How do we move to thinking about small government as being progressive? Well, I think I, think I, I make a distinction between small government being, if you take a sort of the neoliberal conservative view of the world, which is government get out the way, that's certainly not what I'm talking about. I'm actually saying we want government, we want top down, but we want top down to behave in such a way that releases, releases bottom up. That's the key challenge for me. So I don't make a distinction by saying let's create small government just purely for the sake of creating smallness. In fact, there's a section in the book that refers to different models about centralizing localists and localizing centralists and centralizing centralists and localizing localists. It refers to different kind of parts. And there's certain parts of government where the centralizing centralist approach works incredibly well. 
Um, the localizing localist approach tends to be much more people doing radically. It's, it'll be much more like the Jason Roberts view of the world, which is, uh, let's just go out and it's guerrilla action, basically. It's guerrilla urbanism. Let's go out and do something. Let's go out and break the rules this weekend. But sitting between those other two poles are the centralizing localists and the localizing centralists, which are these other groups of people who effectively um, can, provide, can, can provide a role in the process. It doesn't all have to come from the center. Now, the UK is going through a move towards localism. It's not working because government can't release its reins. It still wants to control from the center, but it's saying we want to become increasingly local. Majority of people are saying, okay, we'll just take that. You know, classically, what we've done recently is um, we've created our own community investment company in the small town that I live in to effectively say, well, government said localism. You know, um, they didn't define what localism meant. We're going to define what localism meant. We're going to define it. And we're going to start our own community investment company that's going to effectively take on some of the difficult challenges, those wicked problems that we face in towns and cities. Like, how do you deliver housing for our kids? How do we create jobs for the future? All those sorts of things. And we're saying, we're just going to try this ourselves. And, you know, you slowly mobilize a group of people. You will find, you know, every meeting you go to, there's a 25% who'll say, uh, pie in the sky will never happen, et cetera. You know, but every day our membership goes up and up. And effectively, you start saying, well, this is the start of something. Let's just start by delivering. Let's start it. Let's learn through the process of, of some alternative approach. We don't have a grand vision. In fact, it's very difficult to present a grand vision at the moment in this kind of rapidly changing world. I mean, you know, we know that the demographics are changing so rapidly around, say, my son, my son who's 33. Uh, he's part of that millennial generation. He's a classic hipster. He wants to live in messy urban neighborhoods. He doesn't want to live in a housing estate. He doesn't want to go and work in a business park. He wants to be able to freely travel whenever he wants. He's operating in a complete different world to, say, my world, where my, you know, my parents would have measured my success is, my son's great, he's got a house with curtains. You know, that would be their measure of success. He's got a house with curtains. My son doesn't measure his, his metrics are completely different. He has a complete different world. He will share a house, he'll Airbnb, he'll Uber, he won't drive a car, he won't own a car. He'll, he's in the sharing economy. You know, he's operating a complete parallel universe to the way we're doing things. And by 2025, 75% of the world's economy will be in the millennials. Why are we still doing things this old way? Why are we still doing things in this command and control way where these guys are not into this anyway? Well, what I think, and, and I've interviewed numerous neuroscientists, is that the internet and smartphones have catalyzed a change in people's brains so that they're more bottom up. So it's, it, it, it has unleashed uh, their, their bottom up nature. And I think that millennials are that way because of that. They have different brains. They see the world differently and they interact with it very differently. I think you're absolutely right. And I think you're also seeing changing and the changing values all the time. You know, um, I mean, I would have been classically, you know, of the hippie generation, maybe sort of late hippie generation. And, and, and in the sense that, um, you know, we probably had strong social concerns or strong environmental concerns, which were probably not heard at the time. You know, we were, we were making noises, but no one wanted to listen. Uh, you know, and then, it, then we just co-opted. We just joined the system, didn't we? We became part of, part of the mainstream in some ways. Well, you're seeing these kids now not joining the mainstream. They're basically saying, we're in our world. We'll continue in this bubble. We will measure our, we'll measure our success in completely different ways. And I think that's a, that's a fascinating part. And, and the real question for me is, so what does this mean for cities now? You know, if, if, um, if places are measured by their messiness, and I use the word messiness as fine-grained, mixed-use, complex places, classically, the, the, you know, the early Williamsburgs or some of the new stuff that's happening around New York in, in some of the artist colonies, they're all, they're all signs of, of radical incrementalism at work in a slightly different form. Now, let's go out, let's go and live a different life. Let's try something differently. Um, let's, measure, let's, let's not measure our success by what we own, but, but our experiences. And I think that's a, it's a fascinating challenge. You're also seeing this increasingly in, um, in the emerging world. You're seeing different metrics, you know, whereas traditionally it would be, I must own a house. I must own a house. You know, I must own a house. That was fed to everyone. Home ownership will secure you. Uh, let's build a strong middle class. You're seeing a reaction to middle class, the concept of middle class. And I think that's, you know, I find all those sort of movements quite fascinating. We start saying, well, okay, so how do we plan? How do we plan a future? in this complex, highly adaptive, highly changing world. Well, in reality, we can't. We can, we can pose a couple of scenarios, but we don't have the ability to look into the future anyway. 
In fact, we can't even learn from the past. You know, I often say, uh, particularly a project I'm working on, which is if you've only driven down a, a dirt road all your life and you look through the rear view mirror, all you'll see is dust anyway. You won't learn from what's behind you. You'll just see dust. So the real, the real thing now is it's, we enter that rediscovery phase. We enter that point of saying, how do we relearn? How do we rediscover? How do we reinvent? Your point you said up front about, uh, uh, you know, effectively people are having to relearn the, the neurological kind of um, view that you presented in the early, at the start of the conversation was, how do we rediscover? How do we rediscover the concept of evolution in the way we do things? This innate, innate ability for us to solve urban problems, which we can do collectively incredibly well. We find it very difficult to do individually, but collectively we do incredibly well. Well, I believe, do, I believe that there are literally hundreds of different epigenetic factors that we have within us that have been repressed by civilization, by consumerism, uh, and you say it's the last 60 years. I say it's civilization has, has done it and, and, and consumerism in particular. And I think that epigenetics is all about expression of genes. And what we have to do is enable to create environments that encourage that ex the expression of those genes. I always like to talk about in, in, the, in, in one culture where emotional expression was discouraged, they did autopsies of, of people and they found that 5% of them, their smile muscles had atrophied. Yeah, yeah, I think and, you're right. And it's this, it's this bottom-up epigenetic atrophy that we have to reverse. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I write a lot about it in this, the concept of creating the conditions for good urbanism. In other words, the role of the urbanist is not about commanding and presenting this perfect vision of the future. It's about creating the conditions within which people can, can respond. Okay? So it's balancing the constraints within which creativity happens. So you find you, the role of the planner increasingly is about managing those constraints, but actually recognizing those constraints are not fixed, they're variable. They're variable within certain limits, and you're constantly playing with those, the parameters of those constraints. But the fifth condition I mentioned is activate. You have to activate. You can't just focus on physical projects when you're building cities. The fifth one is absolutely crucial, is how do you activate citizenship? How do you activate civic leadership? How do you activate ethical professionalism? They're all components of how you, how you can start working in an increasingly bottom-up world. And there are, raft, there are rafts and rafts and rafts of techniques to try and mobilize citizen action from the bottom up. Rafts of them. Where they've run from participatory budgeting that happens in Brazil to um, um, asset, uh, um, asset mapping, where you start looking at your community saying, well, there's assets that exist in my community that add up to far more than that school down the road. I an experience um, recently working on a project in Glasgow, which was um, a very deprived area which had just built a new academy, a new bright, shiny school, but the education attainment wasn't, going, wasn't getting any better. Until we found that there were assets that existed in the community, like um, uh, a woman who used to be a vaudeville pianist. She had the only piano in town, a Steinway piano, but there was no music school, and she was lonely. So we kept on saying, well, why don't we just ask her to become the music teacher? Why don't we send kids to her house? So that changed the dialogue between kids and the community that's the first thing it did it took kids out of their classroom made them walk down a the street they became streetwise and moved into this house they had to respect this woman's house because it was her house and of course she taught them she wasn't lonely anymore you know and so this is a classic thing about how do we unlock and that's what we do all the time we constantly freeze out the potential of this creative energy so now this woman is you know she's happy the kids are happy they understand they're interacting with old people in a in a in a trust and respect kind of relationship um, they understanding to be streetwise, and uh, the school's improving. You know, just a classic example. I, I, I write about one of them in uh, one of the stories in, in the book about the the, the, um, the educator. Um, so, there are classic examples where small shifts in behaviour create incredibly big outcomes. Incredibly big outcomes. Just a simple thing like that created an outcome that built confidence in the school and enabled them to tell these kids. It, it, it enabled, it enabled uh, the teachers to think differently about how they behaved as well, because they moved away from this traditional, we have to control these kids, we have to control them, they have to sit, they have to behave. 
to effectively enabling the kids to saying, well, actually, we can get you to a place where you can get music education. The local chemist, you know, who the only person uh, who the pharmacist um, had a thing as a, as, a, as a chemist, he had a, a B in chemistry, but all he was doing is popping pills in a bottle. He became a chemistry teacher. So he was liberated as well from his job. Everyone's, everyone is liberating everyone else by just thinking differently. And it's incredible how these small shifts, you know, well, we've done it once, let's try it again. You know, hold on, this might fail. You know, we might choose to do this, it might not work, but so what? We've tried. And for me, those are the ones, how you can make those small shifts in behaviors and thinking that add up to something far, far bigger than we ever expected. And that's the beauty of cities. Cities are these complex adaptive organisms that um, breathe life all the time. You can't control them in the way uh, we've done, as you said, for, you know, for, for many decades. So you have gotten into dis di discriminating between top-down systems and bottom-up systems, top-down tools, tactics, and strategies, and bottom-up tools, tactics, and strategies. Can you talk a little bit about top-down and bottom-up systems and the tools, tactics, and strategies? Yeah, I mean, so if you look at a classic top-down system in government, so government effectively has ideas, tools, and tactics. You know, the idea is... Um, uh, uh, probably embodied in, say, the Garden City movement or the Modern City movement. Though the idea is the tools are how we're going to implement this kind of way of doing it, and the tactics are how we're going to manage this process. Um, and uh, if you look at um, the ideas, they rapidly translate into complex policies, which are arrestive. They effectively arrest everything. They become so overcomplicated. So I'll give you a classic one. If you write, say, a policy that says we want to become more sustainable. If you look at the policy that's written around sustainability, it becomes absolutely incom incomprehensible by the time it's written. And it arrests everything else happening. It prevents anything else happening. If you look at the, um, the tools that are used, are highly deterministic tools. How do, you, how do you bring about this change in place? We write design codes, we write things, we tell people exactly what, how we want them to do things. Highly deterministic. And that it prevents, it effectively prevents creativity happening. And if you look at the tactics we use in a top-down system, it's command and control. Okay? It's basically restrictive. You know, follow us or else, or we will use the force of law to, to impose ourselves on you. But if you examine a bottom-up bottom system, which, as I said, is innate, people collectively working together, have ideas, have tools, have tactics as well, the ideas translate into simple rules. Okay? The tactics translate into adaptive solutions or emergent solutions, highly adaptive kind of ways of doing. We learn, start, we get better doing it. It's constantly changing. And the tactic that's used is self-organization. So people in groups get together, collectively work together to solve a problem, whether it's building an informal settlement or reclaiming a street or something. And if you look at the outcomes of the two, if you look at the outcomes of the top-down system, it breeds bigness. Because the only people who can understand these complex policies and these deterministic rules, et cetera, are the big players. Because they've got bigger consultants. They've got bigger people working for them. But if you look at what, um, what the bottom-up system creates, it creates organized complexity. This is what Jane Jacobs refers to as organized complexity. So if you put the two together, you can actually see they can't match at all. It's almost like a crime scene tape that exists between top-down and bottom-up. One can't transgress the other. So you can actually see why top-down systems kill bottom-up activity quite quickly, or why bottom-up systems ignore top-down rules. They just ignore them. Majority of people don't read the complex policies. If I have to build a shack in an informal settlement, I'm not going to go and read the local building design codes. I'm not going to read those at all. I'm just going to get on and do it. I'm going to wait for someone to try and throw me out or stop me, and then I'll resist. You know, I'll use my community to act for me. So a lot of what I talk about is how do you effectively change this idea of complex policies into much more simple protocols that people could understand using a kind of computer language. What are the simple protocols that will inform what these simple rules are? How do you move away, instead of focusing on this, these fixed end states, or these deterministic fixed end states that the top-down system looks at, to focusing much more on the starter conditions? How do you create the starter conditions? Because you know if you can get your starter conditions right, complexity delivers outcomes um, that, are, that, are, that are completely different to if there's no starter conditions in place. So put your money into starter conditions. Put, if I'm saying to government, put your money into the starter conditions. Don't focus on the 25-year end state. And then the last one is, how do you move away from a command and control leadership to an enabling leadership? And I'm saying if, if top-down starts behaving in that particular way, which is simple protocols, focusing on starter conditions and focusing much more on enabling leadership, it can start engaging more bottom-up activity, more bottom-up behavior. 
And through this process, through engaging with this process, it can start influencing those outcomes as well. It can start dealing with those balance constraints. It can start shaping an informal settlement into something that will translate into a formal settlement quite quickly and not stay in informality you know, for, long, you know, for, for decades. So for me, the, the key challenge is to say to government, it's easier for you to behave this way than it is for you to behave in, in this, this traditional sort of top-down command and control um, complex policy kind of world that you've been operating in. So a couple things. One, you've got a great quote from D. Hock that I think describes it. Simple principles give rise to complex and intelligent behavior. Complex rules and regulations give rise to simple and stupid behavior. That's uh, right. Yeah. And so our top-down top systems are creating stupid behavior because the majority of people either disregard those policies or alternatively someone's gaming them. So the big players are gaming those, gaming those, um, those complex policies, those complex rules. So talk a little bit more about starter conditions. You refer to that. Yeah, if you looked at, I often say um, in a world where governments have to do more with less, where they're increasingly um, looking for other solutions, other things with um, uh, the promises that they to us, you know, we will this, we will do that, recognizing that they can't. Um, I'm saying uh, internet connection unstable. Uh, I've just had an internet connection. Is that okay? Should we? Yeah, but I can again? hear you. I can still hear you though. So okay. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll wait for you to stop me. Okay. If I see it, sign it. So um, increasingly, if government have to spend less money to achieve the same outcomes, where does it put its money? Now, at the moment, it can say, well, we can solve a hundred houses a month, okay? And at the same time, 4,000 are being built illegally. Okay, so we're solving, we're solving one thing using the top down. So where I am at the moment in Cape Town, for every one government house built, there are 200 shacks built every day. Wow. Okay, so that's the scale of where government is at in terms of solving the problem. It's not, it's not even the tip of the iceberg. They're not even, nowhere near it. So the question is, so where do they put their money? Can they ever afford to, to complete a full house? Do they rather spend their money on laying out land, providing technical assistance, uh, providing basic building services, um, providing simple urban structure, dealing with critical issues like the spread of fire or the spread of disease? You know, all of a sudden, it starts changing the way in which you start thinking about a project. If you don't see it as a physical project only, you see it as starting on the preconditions that enable this place to, tra to, tra to translate into something better. Now, people are not stupid. People can build their own houses. They do it all the time. But they're quite often, in a, when they're building a shack, they're building it because of its temporary nature. They're not certain that they will be allowed to stay there. They're going to be moved on. And that's what tends to happen. Or they're alternatively saying, I'm only here temporarily and I'm going back to my rural um, farm when I get a bit older. So I'm living in a temporary condition. So these places remain locked in what I call trapped in transition because no one's putting the starter conditions that enable these places to transition. They're trapped in this kind of world of the preconditions don't exist for them to move on. So I'm focusing increasingly on saying, where do these start, where do these starter conditions? And increasingly what you need to have is some form of order, um, some form of structured order, because once you have a, a plot laid out with the you know, four corners, you can effectively translate that plot into an asset over time that you can eventually lever out a, a mortgage if you wanted to, or you can, you can you can finance against it. You can so you can transition from informality to formality over time, like happens in South America. The second precondition is that you have to subdivide. You have to start breaking things into small bite-sized chunks, and they must be as regular as possible because it's regularity that creates. Uh, it's one of the preconditions for complexity. I always thought that complexity is about chaos, but it's not. It's about regularities forming quite quickly. So regular ways of doing things happening quite quickly. So you need that regularity. Because once you have regularity, you can start developing typological solutions to solving that, typological ways of building housing. And then the third is you have to create the platforms. In other words, the platforms that enable that, that building to spring to the next level, to go from the two dimensions to the three dimensions. How do you build it? What's the nature of the building industry? What's the nature of the building codes, et cetera? What are the skill sets that are available? The next one is providing defaults. 
simple ways to show people, okay, you can, you can learn, in learning from another, there's a pattern of typological stresses to defaults you can use. Then the final one is, as I said, the activators. How do you really activate that community to, to behave differently, act differently in a completely different way? And how do you build social capital through everything you do? So I often refer to urban society as a combination of two things. It's compact urbanism and social capital. And social capital for me means goodwill, neighborliness, sense of belonging, sense of community, all those sorts of things. But if you can use that social capital to build your compact urbanism, that's when you get the best possible outcome. So when people are actively involved collectively in shaping their environments, building their places, in terms of their needs, not in terms of some imposed need where someone has said, you are going to get a two bedroom house and it's going to look like this. They're saying, actually, here's, here's something that's solving my needs at my particular point in time. And that's where I think we should be going is increasingly focusing on those first government, focusing on those first three things. How do you create structure? How do you create some sort of regular order? How do you create the platforms? And then people will take on and solve the rest of them, themselves. Local building industries will form. Um, They'll solve those problems. We don't need to build housing for people. Okay, housing so we need to take a pause here because we've hit our first hour. And, and as we discussed, we're going to do a second hour. So I just want to say now, this is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. And my guest for this show is Kelvin Campbell. He's the author of Massive Small Change. He's honorary professor at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College, London. And we're going to have another show that we're going to actually going to just continue this conversation now. Um, I'm going to, but what I need to do is, okay, let me just...